very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you, Anuradha. Thank you uh, to all the organizers. Uh, yes, I have moved. So I have been in service uh, at ACTRAC Tata Memorial Center, uh, 13 long year, wonderful years, collaborating with Dr. Kumar Prabhash and the whole team. And uh, now I have relocated to University of Delhi, uh, South Campus at the Department of Genetics. So um, the topic that I have is translating cancer genomics to the clinical practice. And I was thinking that what could actually from the lab uh, that has really could get into and uh, have an, its, its, its impact on the clinical practice. So I thought that uh, I would talk about uh, the work that has been primarily been done in collaboration with Dr. Kumar Prabhash. And this work was actually executed and been done at ACTRAC Tata Memorial Center. So. Um, uh, both, um, uh, we were interested in understanding what is the underlying resistance mechanism to the tyrosine kinase. So, uh, what uh, 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 Kumar had uh, in his mind that let us kind of like go ahead and uh, have um, triplet samples from the same patient uh, after progression, at the time of the baseline, and then get the blood of the same individual, uh, of the same patient as well. And then we decided that, yes, okay, let's go ahead and do a an whole exome sequencing uh, of these folks. Um, uh, and we had all the QC measures by matching up that the, they were uh, indeed paired. And we performed uh, the standard analysis. Um, this, uh, uh, this, this work was uh, very uh, statistically underpowered for the reason it, uh, it's not that easy to get so many number of samples. And we had about still 26 pairs of sample, and that's something that can only happen at Tata Memorial, perhaps. Um, um, but still, it would be underpowered to make discoveries, uh, even though we have it in the uh, longitudinal basis, we have all the samples which are paid. Uh, so we went ahead and completed those samples, and uh, primarily in the lab, it was led by a graduate student in the lab, Supriya Hayat. So Supriya uh, um, um, uh, further stratifies these patients into the early relapse, uh, intermediate relapse and the late relapse. Uh, when they went ahead and when they looked into the exome profiling of these uh, patients, um, that wasn't much of surprise um, because the intention was not exactly to make a discovery based on this sample set because the sample size was lower and as what I said it was statistically underpowered. But there was an interesting trend that Supriya observed. What she, uh, what she found in these uh, sensitive patients and then they're paired when they were um, uh, at the time of progression. She found that there is certain set of alterations. What is, uh, I don't, uh, you don't need to go into the details of it. Essentially what it, the, this is, um, these are the genes and uh, these are the patients in the column and in, uh, in each of those blocks are the allele fraction of these mutations. So what Supriya found was that uh, certain mutations had an enrichment. Um, uh, A, they were retained when there was a relapse. Uh, so they also uh, occurred in the resistance settings, but their allele fraction was much higher and that was pronounced, um, which was an interesting observation, but then it was also intuitive. We were not very surprised that we had. So we were wondering what exactly to mean, what exactly does that mean? So what Supriya did next is that she went into more deeper into it, into the statistics and, and trying to uh, dig some kind of like biology that may be relevant to the clinicians and to the clinical world. So systematically, what did she do is that she looked into the numbers. Here there are 1,000 odd uh, in the baseline alterations. Here there are 800 odd in the relapse. And of these, there were only 153 which were retained. And when we looked at the cancer-specific alterations, um, because uh, in whole exome sequencing, and you would imagine that these are orphan samples, they are not even paid, um, uh, orphan samples, in, uh, so uh, they were paid for, them, uh, for that matter. Um, uh, they were but FFP blocks, so you would have that nuance over there. So, but still, despite for that, it, it is more than uh, uh, what has been shown over here is significant. It is more than by chance that they are finding that there were 153 genes which were retained. And of these, the ones which were uh, enriched were the tumor suppressors. Now, earlier we saw that there was an enrichment of the allele fraction. And now we have the number of the genes and those genes identified which were retained and enriched when there was a relapse among them. So, uh, and this is how the allele fraction kind of like... Uh, uh, went through and this was a very interesting trend what they found is that here are the folks who are early relapse here it is intermediate relapse and here are the late relapse you see that there is an enrichment in the allele fraction from
from um, uh, the early relapse, uh, uh, from the baseline to the relapse in an early relapse patient. There was this was a continuation also in the intermediate range. However, what we really don't understand when it came down to among the late relapse folks. The allele fraction was um, uh, was in a different direction. Now we we believe that this might primarily be because of uh, too much of clones up in here, and because now it is a late relapse, uh, uh, it is way too far more heterogeneous uh, that the allele fraction uh, in overall, on an averaging it out, kind of like decreases. However, there was an increase and in, uh, in in the allele fraction as what we had initially seen. So uh, here comes um, Dr. Kumar Prabhash then uh, decided uh, along with his team, Dr. Vanita Narona, Dr. Anuradha and all, that let's do a step beyond and let's validate this because we were not able to ensure what exactly to make out of this and how do we really validate in our uh, setting and make it clinically relevant. So along with one cell diagnostics in Pune, what uh, Dr. Kumar Prabhash and team, they did, uh, they, uh, they set up a liquid biopsy experiment and uh, they horizontally, um, uh, the samples were corrected and uh, and here now we had, uh, we could bring in the statistical power. It was not only 26 patients, if you would see at the number of collections that were done performed for individual patients, in overall it added up to 243 odd samples. So 243 liquid biopsies were performed using a panel that was developed by One Cell Diagnostics. It was a proprietary of there, and but then it was a kind of a close to CGP. It had 600 odd genes. Um, this is how the schema kind of like looks at. So um, uh, I'm, I'll just cut the long story short. I mean, all the analysis and everything was performed in house uh, at ACTRAC, Tata Memorial Center, um, by the graduate students. And what they found, um, uh, I was going in the reverse direction. What they found is that a that um, uh, there was a I mean you would always do these kind of uh, um, inbuilt um, um, QCs whether there is a consistency in what you would otherwise expect to find they found that those alterations that you find that uh, that was present in the baseline they were also retained um, uh, in the tumor uh, in, in in the uh, in the relapse settings um, from the liquid biopsy so that was an internal QC that was performed that told us so I wouldn't take you into the detail because I have just a 10 minute slot so I wouldn't take you into the details of it. So now we have the finalized data and the manuscript is about to be kind of like communicated. Something very interesting and now we have more of a clarity of what exactly is happening. When we look at the evolution of the clones from the uh, the uh, these 26 odd patient, we are again able to dif um, uh, uh, categorize, stratify them based on the different categories and what we are finding in each one of them, there is something which is called as a founder clone founder clone that the clone uh, which has a set of alterations and that remains um, constant as the tumor is kind of like evolving across through the longitudinal collection and what is then we, when we when we went ahead and when Supriya kind of like goes deeper into it that what is this co uh, composition of this founder clone and that is which is kind of a constant across and what did she find again the same thing bingo those are the ones which are enriched in tumor suppressor alterations. So what it is kind of like doing is that now we have a documental proof, not just from the uh, uh, from um, uh, the uh, tissue biopsy and the whole uh, elegant whole ex exome sequencing performed, but validated across in the 243 samples uh, by liquid biopsy that indeed the tumor suppressor genes, if it is present at the baseline, it cannot be ignored one has to kind of like take that into consideration and it has a strong prognosis associated with it whether it's going to be an intermediate relapse late relapse whether you would want to kind of have a strong therapeutic regimen addressed along with the EGFR and other different kind of like alterations if it is co-occurring or if you would want to go ahead with only with a single uh, TKI. So, um, so uh, this paper uh, is something that is what is uh, being um, uh, communicated now and uh, our conclusion, I have not kind of like emphasized much onto it, is that's what it is. So, uh, but then we also, I also want to talk to, my, I hope there is some few minutes left. Um, that was just an overview of, uh, I have like few minutes left. Uh, so, um, uh, um, and then uh, because I want to talk about something that from the genomics has gone into the clinics. So this was the complete whole profiling done along with Dr. Kumar Prabhash group uh, when it comes to the adenocarcinomas, when it comes to uh, the EGFR profiling um, or the uh, or the KRAS profiling. And um, uh, so this baseline study when we had in the laboratory, uh, this has really transformed um, and and of a great immense here in India. Uh, 
but then uh, as what we were interested i showed earlier as well we were interested in uh, understanding the resistance so uh, here something again and another story from the genomics how it goes into the clinics so uh, um, asim and another graduate student in the lab he established some cell lines uh, pc9 which is uh, harboring exon 19 mutation uh, egfr exon 19 and they are drug sensitive egfr drug sensitive so but then uh, he, uh, with with a uh, with with the treatment of those cells he derived resistant cells out of those guys and um, uh, with all the qcs it is important that whatever we do in the lab uh, it is uh, uh, it is rigorous enough and uh, um, uh, so that um, the cells that what we are working with are the ones that what we know what they are. So even though the cells were resistant, what Asim found is that there was no mutation such as T790M in these guys. So which is not surprising, Asim thought that maybe it is something beyond T790M. The surprise came in when Asim did an NGS on this. When he did NGS, initial observation based on the Sangers was that there was no T790M in the resistant derived cells. But NGS told us a different story. NGS told us that there was was indeed a low allele fraction of T790M, which made, uh, again, the conversation back along with Dr. Kumar Prabhash. Dr. Kumar Prabhash, I learned that there are a lot of uh, primary tumors. Kumar says that there are a lot of primary tumors where there is a low allele fraction of T790M. So, uh, should they be given osibertinib? Should they be, or because it is just 3% of uh, T790M, they can be kind of like ignored. We can wait for when the percentage goes like higher. So, can we do something about it? So what did we do? We decided to make a, a mouse model. And here is another uh, postdoc in the lab, Dr. Ashwin Butle. What he does is that he directly injects the tumor cells, um, uh, the resistant cells and the sensitive cells straight onto the intercostal muscle. And uh, what he showed that there were like orthotopic lung cancer mouse models were established. And using this orthotopic mouse model, um, what did he find is that now the allele fraction is less than 5%. So we are having a model system where uh, T790 allele fraction is 5%. When they are given erlotinib, so here is um, uh, the, the uh, PC9 sensitive cell, you see that the survival uh, is significantly affected. And however, when they are, uh, when they are receiving, um, uh, when, when they become the PC9, they do not respond to erlotinib anymore. When uh, it's osimertinib, when it in the in, in the original cell, uh, there is a high sensitivity. However, when you give osimertinib to the resistant cells, they are still sensitive. So, which is kind of like telling is that that even that there is a low allele fraction of T790M, still it would be clinically relevant. So, and why would that be so? So, clinical relevance would come from as follows. So, when you say that there is a two percent allele fraction, the two percent allele fraction is not because there are two percent of clones out over there. Two percent of cells out over there out of 100 cells but at the EGFR loci if you would imagine that there are 10 copies for example and in that 10 copies if there is one percent which is in all the cells there are 10 copies in one cell one copy is mutated the percent is one percent but it is there across all the cells so and that's how we kind of like tend to get to see that it is the heterogeneity at the loci of the EGFR which is accounting for this low allele fraction of the T790 uh, okay, thanks. So um, uh, we went on to kind of like, um, you know, I mean, that's what the strength of Tata Memorial is. Uh, you, you you keep on building stories one after the other. So um, then again, over a coffee, um, uh, I'm very excited. I run down to Kumar and say that, you know, MT790M is something which is kind of like really, Kumar says, but you know, a majority of the Indian cannot even afford. I mean, being a basic scientist, I don't know how much a uh, OC Martinib even cost. And there I learned that OC Martinib cost about more than 2 lakh rupees per month. There you go. Majority of the, them are not able to kind of like afford it. So can we do anything about it? So there we go. Uh, another student, we come back to the lab. Another student in the lab, we decide uh, uh, to look into the pharmacokinetics of it. Uh, along with Dr. Vikram Gota, what we see is that that osimertinib in the blood survives around even till seven day where its IC50 would still be effective. However, for the, I'm not showing you the details for the allotinib. Allotinib, the turnaround time is 24 hours. So, uh, does that mean that osimertinib would be effective for seven odd days? Maybe. That's an hypothesis. Can we validate? Can we test this? Let's see. Now, we develop another mouse model. That is a tail vein mouse model uh, along with Dr. Ashwin Butle in the lab. I will just run through that. Um, um, so, here is that in the lungs that what you find. These cells are luciferase tagged and that's why you're able to see these tumors. So, what happens is that what... Uh, 
uh, here we are comparing the osimertinib dosing. The, uh, from the pharmacokinetics told us that it could be a week. Let's see, would that be relevant? So here is the erlotinib with the daily dosing and then you see um, that they are effective. When uh, osimertinib given in the daily dosing, they are effective. When the erlotinib is given in once in a week, they are not effective. However, um, I'm not taking into the details of how the tumors were formed. However, when osimertinib was given once in a week, unlike the erlotinib, it was still showing that there was a strong regression in the tumors, at least in the mice. Whether this corroborates to the, uh, to the clinics or not, we still have to kind of like an establish and we still, uh, uh, our paper um, uh, just got like rejected. Um, uh, even Kumar doesn't know about that. So we just got like rejected. Um, we'll have to kind of like recommunicate that. But essentially if this is true and if this could hold and if this would be clinically relevant if Kumar and Vanita and all could kind of like prove that, then the cost would be substantially one uh, to the seventh of this. Uh, without the next yeah. bell, I'm done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, sorry for exceeding the time. So, but all the work that has been done has been done by me, primarily the graduate students uh, over here and the clinical collaborators. So, and uh, thanks to all the funding agencies and thank you for listening it through. Thanks. This is how the uh, genomics can translate into the clinics. Any questions? So, uh, you saw T790M was uh, uh, shown in the uh, PC9 uh, after NGS and somewhere in the uh, clonal heterogeneity data, there was a evolutionary chain coming uh, long back, which was uh, later on revealed as a T790M. So, how long do you think uh, uh, this T790M starts popping up? So, um, uh, we now know we have three different categories, the early, the um, intermediate and the late. Early category is 8 months, Supriya correct me if I'm wrong, and uh, the intermediate is 11 months or something, or 10. And uh, that is what, so we start seeing uh, T790M also in the early ones. So, if that kind of like helps you understand that when the T790M uh, starts kind of like coming up. So, it's that early on. Oh, I'm, I'm to my understanding, I mean, if I had to put, I would say that they are pre-existing. Okay. And so because, because this in this eight, if you would look at the deviation is high, there is also a two month. So uh, even though the cutoff is at eight. So I, I would imagine that they are pre-existing. Uh, so, like so you would like to use osimertinib seven days in low WAF or high WAF also? So, uh, so uh, that's what I was wanting. The reason I kind of like um, uh, wanting to emphasize onto that, when we say low VAF, uh, that means all the cells are still harboring the same mutation. Agreed. It is just that there is a nuance at the EGFR loci. Out of 100 copies, one is mutant. But this one is mutant in across all the cells, majority of the clones out over there. So uh, with that extrapolation, I would say that I would use it even at the low VAF. Low and high both. Yes because I see a significant impact. With world. regard to this low WAF, this uh, hypothesis, is it possible to prove in any way, I mean, to see this high copy number of EGFR everywhere, or um, do you know that there is multiple copies and only oh, one? Yes. Is there some way of... Ah, yes, I mean, uh, so, um, absolutely. I mean, uh, 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 this is kind of like, I mean, rather, uh, I would say that, I mean, you would know it better. I mean, uh, majority of the reports that comes out, Whenever there is an EGFR mutation, you do get to see, if not all the while, you do get to see that there is an amplification and their WAFs would be low. If there is uh, amplification at the EGFR and WAF is low, that is primarily because the mutant copy, the, the wild type copy tend to get more amplified as compared to the mutant copy. So that, that uh, and, and that can very easily be determined if you're really wanting to have an experimental kind of thing that can be done by a real-time PCR, uh, a straightforward experiment to understand what is the allele fraction of mm -hmm. the mutant or the wild type. And uh, that, that has, there's a strong corroboration to it. work and what was there after this paper, uh, what we did is we have gone, uh, didn't, we did two kind of things. One is to give once a week, another one is to give once in three days. Uh, Twice so, a week. Yeah, correct. And we combined that paper is out, that is in public domain now. Uh, so WAF, uh, what you're saying is right, not necessarily that is so uh, no important, uh, but we are trying to get what dose is important. What this gave us a clue that uh, eight, 80 milligram is not a sacrosanct dose. And that is what has uh, no, come in the clinic. And we're trying to see how it, we can take it forward. Uh, Dr. Vanita. 
and uh, wonderful amit as Thanks always <laughs> i just have a comment you said na that uh, 3790 m is from the beginning uh, what i feel i have seen lot of cases and initially uh, we were just doing real time pcr which can very well go yes 5% and even lesser so uh, seeing hundreds and maybe thousands of cases i feel maybe just two or three cases in thousands i have seen t790 m in the beginning i have not seen so that's my experience so, so it, it's all contextual i totally agree that this is not always that's how it kind of like happens but uh, but they do kind of like an occur and if the very vafs are kind of like very low um and 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 it is well established in literature that it is a drug directed i mean drug induced which is which is well established that you give this drug and you treat them for example the pc9 cells that what we worked on initially it didn't have but then it did acquire so it is a mutation that is known to be acquired so you're totally correct and spot on in fact when we started doing digital pcr and we used to have t790m very frequently at very low frequency like in 0.01 so we used to always think that this is true positive then but later on we realized it was some polymorphism which was right. intermingling with the pcr so so there have been assays where t790m has been much higher what we do know also is that i mean there is an association of t790m with the stem cell like features and they are very dormant and that's one of the reason and it has been shown that uh, they don't uh, they don't kind of replicate that fast but they do have some kind of a stem cell like features but it's not very easy to detect it unless you're really going digger deeping into uh, deep into it with a very high resolution i mean um, uh, something uh, to do with a higher uh, depth of uh, sequencing So, so, so there is a, there is a lot of nuance over there. Depending on the kind of technology, if you are using Agena, if you are using Agena as a platform, the mass spec platform, then that may go up to as high as seventy five percent, and uh, that is well documented in literature. However, I mean, how much? It, it's it's a matter of threshold. But there are papers that would describe T seven ninety M occurring in the baseline at seventy five percent, and. Uh, uh if you take sanger it would be 0% if you take a real time pcr it would be 2% 3% it all depend. we don't know what is but what we do not know what is clinically relevant and what is not and what is it what is a um what is the background of the platform that what you are using what is the noise out associated with it you remember punit chandna's data that what we were kind of like working on there was one so is agena more sensitive than digital pcr Uh, I don't think so. Mass because spec. Um, I mean, it, it digital is. Digital should be more sensitive, like what I. Mean. Right. I mean, it is. It is definitely is quite kind of like uh, because the time of flight and what that takes into the, even in the minor um, variation. I would imagine uh, Agena to be more sensitive uh, to the real time PCR and real time PCR also. It all is it the TACMAN based? If it is the cyber green, normally people would do a cyber green thing. TACMAN would have a completely different sensitivity as compared to that. It's always TACMAN. Okay. Sir, correct me if I'm wrong. Where uh, are you? I'm here. <laughs> um, so your study yeah. implies that in other sites as well, uh, whenever we have a WAF of less than five percent, we are not supposed to clinically disregard it, like we generally do in India. So uh, uh, with with a caveat, I'm not a clinician, so I will not be able to make a clinical comment over there. Theoretically, my answer is yes. Do not discard. But that's a, that's that's what a basic scientist thinks. It is relevant. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Amit. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent.